Welcome and thank you for joining SciFast webinar, How to Win Your Next Trademark Battle, Lessons Learned in 2023. All participants are in listen-only mode. You are encouraged to submit questions throughout the program using the Q&A section located on the right side of your WebEx window. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions. Any unanswered questions will be followed up by email after the webinar. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and presentation materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next top slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. This presentation has been prepared by Cyphon Shaw for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Ken Wilson. Ken, you may begin. Thank you, Sadie. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thought we'd spend 30 seconds and I can introduce myself and my colleague can introduce herself. I'm Ken Wilson. I'm the chair of the trademark practice here at Cyparth. I've been doing this full time as an IP attorney since 1992, so I'm 31 years in, and I practice in the LA office. So, turn it over to Lauren. Uh, thanks, Ken. My name is Lauren Leipold. I'm a partner in Cypher's Atlanta office. Um, Ken and I often um, work together on these types of matters and have quite a bit of experience litigating um, both in federal court and at the TTAB. Um, and wanted to share a little bit about what we have learned along the way, especially in the past year and how it can help you in your practice. So to give you an idea of what we intend to cover, we don't intend to cover every single case that came out last year that touched on trademarks because that A is impossible and B, most of it's pretty picky you and something you might look at for particular research questions. So when we were preparing this, we looked at some of the notable cases, which um, there's one obvious one that will pop out early. And also cases where that presented sort of an intersection between the prosecution side of trademark law and the litigation side of trademark law. We wanted to touch on those because there are a number of times, and you'll hear this during the course of the presentation, where what happens during the prosecution of a trademark matters considerably down the road. So learning from Ms. Leipold's prior career as a reporter, she's taught me don't bury the lead. So we will open this presentation with Jack Daniel. Thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, so we have all read the headlines. We have all seen the jokes about dog poop. Um, and so we kind of know the facts here. You know, this is in relation to a parody um, of the famous Jack Daniels bottle trade dress trademarks that we all know so well um, and a, a dog toy where, you know, the number two was in place of number seven, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why this case is really interesting to me as a trademark litigator is because it um, picks apart this really fundamental question about what do you do when someone, when a defendant inserts a First Amendment defense? How do you determine which test applies? Um, and it's sort of, it's interesting because of the way the case law has evolved over the years. Um, there's always been this tension between this sacred protection over free expression, artistic expression, um, and freedom of speech, and yet there's also the important interest in protecting brand owners and protecting consumers, quite frankly, from becoming uh, confused in the marketplace. And so this tension came to a head in 1989 um, when the Second Circuit was deciding a case, uh, the case Rogers versus Grimaldi, um, which involved Ginger Rogers and uh, Fred Astaire, uh, their names used in the title of a movie, um, which ended up being okay. And the court explained that because of this really important First Amendment interest, we have to change the way that we look at um, the likelihood of confusion analysis. And in fact, we're not going to even apply those traditional likelihood of confusion factors that you normally see, we're going to create this entirely new test. And it's a two factor test. Um, and, and the first prong of it is, does the use of another's trademark have any sort of artistic relevance to the underlying work at issue? 
Um, if yes, and it's often going to be yes, um, then you might make it to the second prong, which is, you know, is the artist here being explicitly misleading as to the source of this material or, you know, the content of this material and who created it. So, in contrast to the likelihood of confusion factors, which in the ninth circuit, which was um, the circuit at issue here, which applies the sleek craft version of the test, um, this really doesn't even look at consumers' perceptions in the marketplace. You know, the traditional factors would involve, um, you know, strength of the mark, similarity of the mark, similarity of the goods, channels of trade, classes of consumer, um, and those sorts of things that we've all you know, seen time and time again, that's not really an issue here. We're looking more at almost the intent of the artist. Um, you know, what did they intend? Were they trying to um, commercialize something or were they really truly creating art here? Um, the cases along the way in, in all circuits, quite frankly, I've taken a deep dive into this because I was, I happened to be litigating a case that um, these issues were sort of coming to a head right as Jack Daniels was at the Supreme Court. Um, and, and in all circuits, um, basically, someone raises their hand and says 1st amendment, and then the court will reflexively apply the Rogers test. Um, so, uh, Jack Daniels wanted to challenge that and, and that's um, what brought us to the Supreme Court. Next slide please. So, there you see a ginger and Fred, um, whose case is <coughs> still alive and, and well today, um, but not as much. So, this case started um, back in, in the district of Arizona. Um, originally, Jack Daniels prevailed in the trial court where um, the court said, look, Rogers isn't going to apply where someone's using a, a trademark for source identification, um, which, as we all now know, is what the Supreme Court ultimately concluded. But we had to go through a few iterations, went up to the Ninth Circuit and came back before we got there. Um, the Ninth Circuit obviously disagreed, said you need to apply Rogers. Rogers is what's applicable to this likelihood of confusion claim, not the sleep craft factors, because it's artistic expression, it's parody. And for that same reason, you know, dilution, although there's this statutory exception for non-commercial use, this is a parody, doesn't apply, just sort of bar none, that's it. Um, so applying Rogers, um, the district court found, well, you're not gonna be able to show me that there's no artistic relevance, and you're not gonna be able to show me that there was any explicit intent to mislead. In fact, look, there was a disclaimer on there um, saying we're not affiliated. So, you know, surely there, there's um, enough to allow this to proceed as a parody and the Ninth Circuit affirmed. So then we get to the Supreme Court. Um, on the next slide, the Supreme Court um, basically sort of decided, well, we're not going to do what Duck Daniels wants, which is to get rid of the Rogers test altogether. We're not going to overrule it. There are certain situations where, yes, we do need to protect um, this sacred right of free expression and, and, and artistic um, integrity, essentially. Um, and we're not going to, to um, totally eviscerate that, but we are going to cabinet to some extent because thinking about what the Lanham Act is made to do, it, it, it's designed to um, protect against consumer confusion, and you certainly can't free ride off someone else's goodwill when you're really trying to just sell products. And here we had dog toys. You're just trying to sell the dog toys. People know exactly what you're ripping off and you're trading on that goodwill. Now, the court didn't go so far as to actually go through the likelihood of, of confusion factors. It just said, in this case, you can't just automatically apply Rogers. You've got to go back, lower court, take a look at what what would happen under likelihood of confusion test. Um, you know, various factors, including the fact that it's a parody, perhaps the defendant's intent might come into play in that analysis, but you do have to use that more stringent test. Um, and this is really drawing a very important line that uh, so far appellate courts seem to be following and, and sort of keeping in line here. And so as the parties on remand are briefing summary judgment, we've seen a couple of cases where the courts have expressly said, Jack Daniel says we can't just apply Rogers here. You guys need to look at this under the likelihood of confusion factors. So we first saw this in the second circuit's decision in Vans versus Mischief. Um, that came out in December. That involved the iconic shoe, the old school Vans shoe, which is so well known. And Mischief is an artist collective that um, wanted to make commentary on sneakerhead culture and consumerism, and so created this sort of 
what they called a parody kind of version, exaggerating the, the features of the Vans um, trade dress that is so well known. Um, the this was originally allowed to to slide under Rogers and the Second Circuit said, whoa, 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 we're not talking here about, you know, a piece of art that's up on a shelf uh, behind a piece of glass. You are selling these sneakers. People have returned them to you for the wrong size because they're wearing them as sneakers. Um, you, this is clearly a commercial endeavor here, guys. Um, you better look at the likelihood of confusion factors. And so remanded and said explicitly, Jack Daniels told us this is so. Um, the Ninth Circuit, a similar situation in the punch bowl case, which just came down a couple weeks ago, and the Ninth Circuit affirmed that expressive use of a mark is not immune from the traditional likelihood of confusion inquiry. Um, in that case, you had the, the plaintiff was a sort of social media um, e invitation sort of evite similar um, type of service um, and AJ press the defendant had created. Um, after Punchbowl was in existence, a news service called Punchbowl News. Um, obviously, as a news service, raised their hand and said, First Amendment protection here, um, which originally the, the trial court fought, and so did the Ninth Circuit. And what happened is a, a week after the um, Ninth Circuit came down with their opinion, the Supreme Court granted cert in Jack Daniels. And so the Ninth Circuit uh, said, actually, we take it back. We're looking at this again, and we're going to remand because you need to apply the likelihood of confusion factors. Again, we're talking about commercial use. Um, this is a situation where you're potentially using the trademark as a source identifier, and we're not just going to automatically let it slide under Rogers. Um, so while it's a little more confusing in some sense in that we don't have clear cut lines in terms of when a one test versus the other will be applied, we know for sure that it's not going to be a reflexive application of Rogers, which is, I think, huge for brand owners um, and a really important rule of thumb moving forward when you are thinking about um, how you're litigating, especially in this marketplace today where consumers are seeing this product placement and this fluidity between, you know, what is artistic expression a movie and what is um, commercial use and where do we draw the line there? Um, and, and it's just not, it's, you, you can't automatically get a free pass by um, raising your hand and, and saying First Amendment. So that's a really important rule of thumb to, to take um, moving forward. Um, I'm going to throw it to um, Ken now, who will discuss another important uh, decision that came down in 2023 at the Supreme Court. Thank you, Lauren. Now we're going to talk to more of the mundane as opposed to the artistic. Um, in Abitron, which was one of the other Supreme Court trademark cases, the Supreme Court was faced with how do we apply the Lanham Act on an extraterritorial basis? And that has been a tension that's been around since 1946 when the act passed. passed. And over the years, there have been several cases at various different levels discussing whether or not a particular action by a particular defendant would give rise to liability in the United States. Um, a couple come to mind, the Grupo Gigante case out of the Ninth Circuit and the Pirate Joe case out of the Ninth Circuit. Um, but here we have a somewhat different situation. Next slide, please. In Hetronic, Hetronic distributes remote controls for very large pieces of machinery. Um, and it entered into distribution agreements with several EU distributors. And the agreements essentially provided that the distributors would only use Hetronic approved parts to build the product. So it wasn't built in the US and shipped out, it was actually put together by the various distributors in their home countries. And during the course of the relationship between Hetronic and its various distributors, the distributors started using non-approved parts. As a consequence of that, Hetronic sued them for breach of the distribution agreement. And the initial lawsuit filed against two of, two of these distributors was simply for breach of contract. And the basis for jurisdiction, which becomes important here, and we'll talk, I'm going to talk about that in a, in a minute or two, there's a choice of law provision in the distribution agreements that provided for venue and law to be decided under the law of Oklahoma and the venue in Oklahoma City. And as a general proposition, those types of provisions are enforceable. I'm sure there are exceptions. And so as a consequence of that, suit was filed in Oklahoma. Initially against two defendants for breach contract, and then it was expanded to add the trademark and trade dress infringement claims because these distributors were using the Hetronic trademark 
in connection with or on goods that weren't actually officially approved goods by Hetronic. The jury awarded $115 million in damages um, against the various defendants in various amounts. About 96 million of that was, were based on sales that were outside the U.S., which is not surprising since all of these were non-U.S. distributors. In addition to that, the court granted a worldwide injunction against the distributors from distributing Hetronic branded merchandise. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the question that the Supreme Court had to face is, can the Lanham Act be used to apply to actions that are taking place completely outside the United States? And that extraterritorial effect, is that something that you can recover in a lawsuit brought in Oklahoma? The answer was 9-0, no. The Lanham Act does not apply to non-U.S. sales that were made to non-U.S. buyers for non-U.S. use. And that's really where most of these damages came from, is the non-U.S. buyers buying things and using them in Europe. Where it got interesting, and there was a 5-4 split in terms of exactly what the Lanham Act does reach. The majority, not surprising, said that it, you need some sort of use in commerce, and that use in commerce has to be used in either U.S. commerce, or as many of you know, U.S. commerce affecting foreign commerce. Um, so the majority said that. The minority said it only causes, you can only reach it if it causes U.S. confusion, which is an intriguing question. And one of the, one of the um, examples given was what happens if you have a counterfeit coach bag sold outside the United States that's brought back to the United States and resold? So now you have confusion in the United States based on activity that took place outside the U.S. Um, those questions are going to be answered going forward. Those questions are extremely important, especially in the world we live in now where almost everything is global. So we're buying things, we're selling things, some of it's totally U.S.-based, some of it not U.S.-based. But even then the company, you know, the owner of the trademark could be a European company selling in the U.S. and vice versa. So a couple of takeaways from the case um, from a practical perspective. One of them is the reminder that non-U.S. trademark registrations matter because they give you an avenue for remedies outside the U.S. You know, the downside of some of that is some of the remedies that are provided under non-U.S. law are not quite as, shall we say, draconian as the remedies provided here or not as broad. It also raises some interesting drafting concerns or drafting considerations in the sense that if you're entering into a distribution agreement with non-U.S. parties, you might think about not only the choice of law provision, which, which seems sort of like an obvious statement, but possibly some sort of liquidated damage provision such that if there's a breach of the contract, by contract, the owner of the trademark would be able to reach profits or some sort of amount of recompense by virtue of the breach. So as a consequence, we're not relying on the Lanham Act to reach these non-U.S. activities, but rather the contract itself to reach these non-U.S. activities. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out, and particularly the unanswered question of what commerce actually can be touched going forward. But at least for now, we know that if you have completely non-U.S. sales and non-U.S. infringement that doesn't affect the U.S., other than the fact that the trademark owner, the original trademark owner lives here, that cannot be reached by the Lanham Act. So we do have some clarity on that. So I will flip it back again, um, and we'll talk about some of the lower court decisions. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh oh, we may be having some technical difficulties. I think here. we have technical problems. Our slides do not think by themselves. Um, well, while we are resolving that, um, I can go ahead and start uh, launching into sort of the first case that we want to talk to you about, which is another one that has grabbed some headlines, um, and that was the Hermes um, versus Rothschild case. We all um, paid attention to the, the so-called Meta Birkins case when um, a jury came back and <laughs> awarded a lot of damages in connection with this artist selling of these digital images um, online. And so it, 
why this case is so important is because it's really the first uh, opinion on the merits of what happens when you're applying um, trademark law in a virtual environment and you're trying to enforce um, your real world trademark law, uh, trademark rights in that environment. Um, this sort of came to a head. I remember during the pandemic, we uh, all were under the impression that the metaverse was going to take over and everybody was going to be walking around with these like goggles on everywhere they went. Um, and we were telling clients, get on file. You better be filing your trademark applications for virtual goods right now um, because this stuff is going to become important. And it still is important, but but the lesson that this case um, can can teach us is that, you know, it, it depends. It, it may not you may not necessarily have to register for every single good you have in a virtual space because of how consumers perceive things these days. Um, so you can see here on the slide, th this is the image of the, the Meta Birkins um, that Rothschild claimed were an absurdist statement on luxury goods. We all know the famed Birkin bag, and this was supposedly commentary on that. Um, Hermes said, no, 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 you are a digital speculator. Um, you are trying to make money off of us and you're getting people to click on your stuff because they recognize the famous Birkin mark and they recognize the shape of that bag, which is also protected. Um, so the important thing to remember here, uh, because since Rothschild asserted the First Amendment defense, there is a distinction between the NFT, the non-fungible token, and the underlying good itself. Um, so the, um, the non-fungible token is essentially authenticating. Um, its value isn't authenticating the original work. Um, but it isn't part and parcel of the original work necessarily. And the court looked at that um, in one of the uh, underlying opinions on summary judgment um, where it punted everything to the jury, but said, look, um, you know, the commercialism aspect is is relevant here. And it comes into play when you're talking about the NFTs and selling the NFTs as these valuable items and that they're authenticating the art. Um, they sold these NFTs using the domain name metaberkin.com, social media handles also um, encompassing the Birkin mark. Um, so this goes beyond just pure artistic expression, um, Hermes argued. So another important thing to recognize in this case is that there was actual confusion, which for those of you who litigate these types of cases, you probably know um, there often um, it's difficult to find these kinds of cases and document them appropriately in a way that creates sort of credible evidence. But when you have it, um, it's pretty darn important. And here, because it was so obvious to people that, you know, every brand is expanding online, as I alluded to earlier, that obviously there must have been a partnership collaboration between Rothschild and Hermes. Next slide. Um, so this case is interesting because it is an application of Rogers again. Um, but in this case, even under the Rogers standard, the defendant um, wasn't able to prevail. And a jury found Rothschild liable for trademark infringement, dilution, and cyber squatting. Um, I think awarded $133,000 in damages and a permanent injunction. Uh, I think in part, a lot of this was, you know, like, like I alluded to on the, on the prior slide, this idea that the NFT is sort of a commercial token and entity in and of itself separate from the art. And that is where the use of the mark was really also um, intricately entwined. So the case is on appeal to the second circuit. Rothschild says this is not the end of the story. One of the interesting things to note is that Ms. Chick, remember that defendant that we talked about in the Second Circuit case where the Second Circuit said, uh, you don't automatically get a pass into Rogers. Um, they, are, they have filed an amicus um, at the Second Circuit, just really sort of decrying this um, evisceration of First Amendment rights as they see it in their um, artistic integrity, et cetera. And meanwhile, you know, brand owners obviously have quite a stake in this this debate also, um, especially again with that expansion of uh, commercialism online. So one of the things I just wanna flag for everybody as, a, as an important takeaway is that 
you know, as I mentioned before, we originally were telling people file in every single class and, you know, make sure you get your 9 and 42 registrations in addition to, you know, say class 25, as was the case here. Um, but here they were able to, when they filed the case, they didn't have virtual goods registrations, but they were playing in that space and that was enough. And the registrations that they relied upon were for real world goods. And that was perfectly sufficient to enforce um, even in a digital environment. And so, you know, we've seen situations where we've seen bad faith squatters try to get in and apply for virtual versions of goods under um, a brand owner's trademark. But typically, even the trademark examiners will sometimes flag this and say, it's obvious that they're trying to create a connection here because this is what brands do these days. And so knowing that and knowing um, what the consumer perception is, I think is really important to take into account when you're formulating your um, your registration and enforcement strategy um, moving forward from here. Next slide, please. At and I'll throw point, it to Ken to discuss Spirian. Perfect. At this point, we're, we're starting a slow transition from the federal courts back to the TTAB. Um, Lauren and I actually practice quite a bit in front of the TTAB, so these cases are near and dear to us. Spirion was a case out in the federal circuit in 2023 that discussed the crowded field theory, which most of us are probably aware of. If you harken back to juice generation, the question is whether there's a, the common element between two different marks might have a meaning to the public such that they are readily distinguish, able to distinguish between two marks that include that common element and something else. So in this case, the plaintiff um, asserted three different flex formative marks which are shown at the top here, flex, flex, and flex pulse. And the applicant was had applied for FL space flex. And the goods were similar, and, and but but so the general issue here was what, what was the conceptual strength of that mark flex, which is usually decided under the six DuPont factor. The applicant asserted 30 registrations and said it would, because of those 30 registrations, flex is known in, in the field, has its own common name, and the fact that we have the FL there to distinguish us from other flex marks is sufficient to avoid any likely confusion. The board, in looking at it, started to discount them. And if you look at recent board decisions, that's a very common um, approach. First thing the board will do is figure out whether or not the asserted third-party registrations actually are relevant to the question of the conceptual strength of the trademark being asserted by the opposer. And in this case, four of them were canceled, which they canceled registrations, which in and of itself is something that sort of a, a practice tip. Sometimes that happens because of the time differential between briefing and evidence. You present your evidence maybe today and you're not going to file your brief until sometime three, four, or five months from now. So double checking those, what you've asserted and making sure they're still valid is probably a good idea when you're at the briefing stage. Or it could have canceled afterward. Regardless, four canceled registrations obviously don't have any relevance because they don't have any real legal standing. Three of them were pending applications, which again, a pending application simply says that somebody's applied for the mark. It doesn't show necessarily use of the mark. Three for, were for what the board considered to be completely unrelated services. And 15 of them were compound marks, marks where flex was presented together with some element that, according to the board, caused the, the overall commercial impression of the mark to be different from what was at issue in the opposition. So that left five marks, three that were flex alone, two that were formatives, load flex and value flex. The board, given those five said that is not really pervasive evidence of the use of flex. And as a consequence of that, the conceptual strength of the opposer's mark was still strong enough to cause confusion. We concluded that confusion was likely. This was appealed to the federal circuit, which reversed. Next slide, please. In so the Federal Circuit did a couple of things in terms of finding that it, it should be reversed. One, it said that the compound marks, those 15 marks that included flex together with another term, 
should have been considered by the board. And part of the reason for that is because the applicant itself had a flex formative mark, had an FL next to flex. So discounting other marks that included other elements was inappropriate. So the shared se segment may be, and this is really the test for a crowded field, is whether or not it has a commonly understood meaning to the consuming public. Um, it, and then it, then it raised an interesting question, which is the burden of proof on use. And over the years, the board has, has opined many times that just because there are applications or registrations of third-party marks doesn't tell us anything about how they're being used. And if we don't have any evidence of how they're being used, we can't really conclude that the consuming public would view these marks in some fashion that would cause the common element to become descriptive or suggestive. So it's become commonplace now for an applicant not only to present evidence of perhaps a prior registration, but also evidence of how those marks are being used in the marketplace. Usually that's fairly thin, just because of practicalities. You'll find websites, maybe a few examples of use in, in the various cases that discuss crowded fields. But the burden has always been put on the applicant to prove that use, prove that the public is actually seeing the marks that are at issue, the, the third-party marks that you're trying to raise. So the board looked at that and said, we're looking at it a little bit differently. If you have a third-party mark that is identical and it's on identical goods, then the burden of proving non-use is on the opposer. We're talking about a registration, so inherently there must be some use of the mark in order to have it registered. And if, in fact, it's not being used, it's on the, the opposer side to actually present evidence of that non-use. Um, this could, I could see this happening very often in a Section 66 or 44 type of registration where you don't need actual use in commerce in order to get the registration. And there are also situations where simply a, an old registration may no longer be used by the party that registered it. The board left open what the question, what, whose burden it was to prove non-use when you don't have identical marks, when you have these compound marks, or you don't have identical goods. Whether How that gets answered is an interesting question. I think on a going forward basis, I would assume it's still on burdens on the applicant to prove that use, to prove that commercial impression by the public, but we'll, we'll see. And there are a couple of cases that followed, or maybe not followed, but were decided around the same time. One of them is the old Mexican foods case, which is on the screen here, which simply clarified that the applicant still has the burden of proof use of non-identical marks on non-identical goods. So at least one non-presidential opinion by Judge Larkin says that that's the case. And there's another case which is not cited here, which is, um, let me bring it up here for a second. It was a Alboro versus Knuckle Sandwich case decided in 2023, where the board looked at use, common law use of Alboro in connection with Mexican restaurants and concluded that evidence of that common law use, and I forgot how many there were, 10, 15 of them, was sufficient to show that the opposer's mark was conceptually weak. So the jurisprudence is still out exactly on how, whose burden of proof it is, although it becomes clearer with some of these cases like Ole Mexican Foods that, in fact, it's going to be, continue to be on the applicant to prove use of non-identical marks on non-identical goods. But it's definitely worth looking at every time this is raised, either if you're representing the opposer or the applicant, make sure that you get the burden right. So why don't we move on to the next slide? Now we get into some uh, more a ver I don't know, a rarefied view of some of these things. In, in San Antonio Winery, an issue was raised regarding how do you serve a non-U.S. defendant. And for anybody who has filed a lawsuit against a non-U.S. defendant, regardless of the, of the area, trademarks or whatever it may be, obviously that's difficult. We have the Hague Convention on Service, which helps at times, but obviously takes a long time to do it. There are a number of countries around the world that are not signatories to the Hague Convention, which makes it even more difficult to serve a non-U.S. defendant. So San Antonio Winery 
raised an issue that had been looked at before by some of the district courts, but not by a federal court of appeal. And the question relates to part of the application process and part of Section 1 of the Lanham Act. And Section 1 of the Lanham Act says that you can designate a resident for service of process at the time you're applying for your mark. And it only applies to applicants not domiciled in the U.S. for obvious reasons. You can always serve somebody here. They can designate someone who may be served notices of pro or process in proceedings affecting the mark. And the issue before San Antonio Winery Court was what does the, word, the phrase proceedings affecting the mark mean? And if there is no designation, then the director of trademarks can be served with process, again, for proceedings affecting the mark. Prior to San Antonio Winery, there are a number of district court cases. There was a Gallo case out of the Eastern District of California that looked at it from the perspective of, this is section one of the Lanham Act, and the Lanham Act deals with the registration of trademarks. Ergo, proceedings affecting the mark only means administrative proceedings. It doesn't mean anything in court. San Antonio, the court looked at that and said, well, the statute actually doesn't say that. And it found, as a case of first, um, first impression, that proceedings affecting the mark does include lawsuits, provided the lawsuit involves a mark that has been applied for or registered with the PTO. So in those situations, now Section 1E of the Lanham Act would apply, and in those situations as a plaintiff, you'd have the opportunity to serve the domestic representative, if there is one, or in the absence of that person, the director. If you serve the director, what the director will do is just take the process, summons, complaint, whatever documents, and mail them to the address of record for the applicant, for the registrar. In this case, Ninth Circuit reversed, remanded back to the Central District here in Los Angeles, and default judgment was entered. Next slide, please. For those who have missed the domestic representative box, it's probably because it's somewhat buried in the application. And this is a, a screenshot from Tease showing where it is. And it's an interesting phrasing, if you look, because it says you may, you can click here to designate one, you're not required to designate one. Nowhere does it say what the impact of it is, honestly. So if you do click the box, it gives you the name, you know, another syllable form to put in the name or address of whoever it is that you're going with. Next. So following that case, there have been a couple of cases that have dealt with the domestic representative question. One out of the Southern District where the plaintiff first asked the attorney of record on the application at issue, will you accept service? And they said no which is consistent because the good news about being a lawyer is we get to control the scope of our representation. If you're not authorized to accept service, you don't have to accept service and probably can't. So what the, this court said that, okay, in light of the fact that you can't serve the attorney of record, you can use the alternative service on the director because there's no domestic representative. And the case went forward from there. Consulting Rosa was a case out of Florida again addressing the same issue, again in a situation where there was no domestic representative. In that case, the court said, you are authorized to serve the consul of record, and if that fails, then you can serve the director. How that played out, I'm not, we're not entirely sure, but that puts an interesting onus on trademark application counsel because you have to affirmatively state, I'm not authorized to accept it. So when the lesson learned from this is when representing a non-U.S. defendant or a non-U.S. applicant, consider a domestic representative because at one level it makes it cleaner and easier and better for your client if in fact they have a known entity or person who is authorized to accept service. Because it only defaults to the director if in fact there is no domestic representative. So that's the takeaway next time you file an application for a non-U.S. defendant or applicant, think about that part. Now to the TTAB. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to continue to get farther and farther into the weeds on um, <laughs> intricate procedures at the TTAB um, that Ken and I tend to, to live from day to day. Um, and these are the kinds of things that are, you know, if you know about them and your opponent doesn't, your opponent's going to be in trouble. This will set you apart. Um, and and Ken and I both, I think, learned something from the next couple of cases that we're going to share with you. Um, this first case is Sterling Computers versus IBM Corp. Um, it stuck out to me number one because it's precedential, um, and the board, for whatever reason, doesn't issue precedential decisions every single time um, and has gotten increasingly persnickety about citing precedential decisions. Um, so, you know, that's number one. But number two, I had no idea how important the ESTA cover sheet is. Um, and, and this is a cautionary tale on that front. Um, for those of you who may have filed at the TTAB, ESTA is the electronic um, filing mechanism that the TTAB uses. And when you are filing a notice of opposition, you typically will just, um, it's like a fillable form um, that you fill out and then um, it will spit out with your, your final filed copy, a sort of um, representation of what all you put in there, where you cite the information about the various parties and the marks that issue, et cetera, et cetera. So, in this case, um, IBM filed um, an application to extend registrations from um, from France um, into the U.S. pursuant to the Madrid Protocol. And those are for Sterling and IBM Sterling marks. Um, so, Madrid applications or 66A applications, as you might know them, um, are provide a mechanism to um, extend foreign registrations into the U.S. through the Madrid Protocol through sort of a streamlined process. Um, it involves basically extending an international registration um, that you get through WIPO. Um, and so all of this is run through WIPO and the International Bureau and um, the International Bureau gets notified of what's going on anytime one of these applications is at issue. Um, so what is interesting here and what I didn't realize is that there's a special set of rules that apply when there's an opposition to one of these 66A applications. So in this case, um, Sterling Computers opposed IBM's applications and they cited use-based applications. And I highlighted use-based because that's gonna become important in a moment um, for Sterling and Sterling and Design, a stylized version you see there on the left. Um, so they cited that in their cover sheet. They also cited common law rights in Sterling computers. The, the form for the cover sheet allows you to insert applications, registration numbers, and then also provides a blank to insert common law rights. Um, Sterling also relied upon, um, at least within the notice of opposition, it's um, common law rights in the applied for marks. It's got those common law rights based on use, um, and those are use-based applications. Um, but that's in brackets because they didn't specifically spell that out in the little box that allows you to cite your common law rights. Next slide, please. So here's sort of a reminder of what the cover sheet looks like. Once you fill out the form, it, it spits it out. Um, I have learned through this case that it is not just some technicality um, and that it is very important. And so when I mentioned a second ago about the, the box to fill out the common law rights, that's there on the bottom. Um, information technology consulting services, hardware resale services, and hardware maintenance and installation services is their description of the common law rights in those goods. Um, next slide. So um, what is important to know here is because we are talking about a 66A application, um, there is a report to the International Bureau. And the report that gets sent to them is just the ESTA cover sheet. It is not the underlying notice of opposition, um, which may spell out in more detail exactly what it is that you are supposedly relying on in um, opposing a particular application. And um, I personally did not realize that there are uh, the trademark rules specifically spell this out. If you look at rule 2.104C, uh, it specifically says that application oppositions to applications filed under 66 are limited to the goods, services, and grounds set forth in the ESTA cover sheet. Um, you cannot, under the, the plain language of the statute, 
seek to um, refuse registration based on anything that wasn't transmitted to the International Bureau in that notification, i.e. the cover sheet. Um, and then again, in rule 2.107B, it confirms that once this op opposition is filed, it can't be amended to add grounds for opposition or goods or services beyond those identified in the notice of opposition. The grounds of opposition are limited to those identified in the ESTA cover sheet, regardless of what is contained in any attached statement. In other words, you can put in your notice of opposition that you're relying on common law rights, but if you didn't fill out that little box with the common law rights on your cover sheet, you're out of luck. Next slide, please. So, in this case, um, the saving grace was that uh, the applicant had filed on uh, under 1A, a use based application as opposed to intent to use. And so, because of that, the board ultimately said, well, you adequately provided notice that you were going to rely upon those common law rights because you cited use in connection with the marks that are the subject of these applications. And so that's sufficient. So, you know, there on the right, you can sort of see part of the form that you fill out when you're, you're citing the marks um, that will go into the cover sheet. And the first part asks you to enter the serial or registration numbers of your pending applications or registrations. Um, and then the lower part allows you to provide for those common law rights. So because in this case, there were use-based applications cited, that was sufficient. And we're at the board, read a notice pleading standard, and there was notice technically in this cover sheet that was sent because of that use-based application. However, um, tread lightly here, because if you are asserting a 1B application, and as we all know, often clients just find it way easier to file a 1B and not have to get their specimen together and just get on file and get the filing date, um, even if they are using the mark. If your client has done that, or if you have done that um, as, as a mark owner, and you're then wanting to rely on those common law rights, and you're in a uh, 66 world, you better be sure that you then explicitly state that you have common law rights in the cover sheet, or you will be precluded from relying upon those rights later. So another, um, just you know, again, very technical, but very important, and potentially a rule that could have some big impact on proceedings moving forward. Next slide. Um, so here's the second case at the TTAB, the Appleton case, which again was, I think, a little bit frightening in the way that this rule um, played out uh, for the applicant here. It feels a little bit unfair, and yet um, it is what the what the law is at the TTAB right now. Um, this case is not precedential, but it just happens to be sort of the most recent word on it. There's a, a great body of law. If, if you look, we have sites we can share that confirm um, sort of the rule of law that we're about to tell you. So in the Appleton case, the opposer owned rights to Nen Nena Lovett and Lovett for clothing, handbags, various goods, and related design services. Um, so they asserted those rights to oppose an application um, for Lovett for handbags. Um, what is interesting here is the way that the timeline played out. Um, because priority is going to become an issue. So the applicant began using its mark Lovett back in September of 2017, filed this application in December of 2019. Um, the opposer had been using the mark but didn't have anything on file at the time, um, later filed an application and waited until you know, almost six months after the applicant filed to file its application um, to try to protect its rights. And then just a couple weeks later filed to oppose the applicant's application. And it cited in its notice of opposition, this, um, pending application, but obviously it didn't have a registration yet to rely upon. So during the course of the proceeding, obviously the applicant's, um, application can't move closer to registration, but that's not stopping the examiner from continuing to look at the opposer's application, which is still pending and is being examined in parallel while the TTAB is addressing this proceeding. Um, so the examiner looks at it, finds um, it appropriate to publish, it issues the registration during the course of this proceeding. Um, then the party's trial period opens when the parties have to submit evidence in support of their claims. Remember, I told you there was that pending application at the beginning, um, and 
the TTAB rules allow for um, applications and registrations cited in the notice of opposition with properly um, pleaded allegations and um, TSDR printouts showing the status and title of the application. Those sorts of things can be put in the record here. We had a subsequent registration issued. And so the opposer filed a notice of reliance saying, look, hey, board, we got this registration. We're going to assert this um, in support of our claims here. So they were able to do that. They went to trial um, and they argued we have priority because we have this prior registration that we have at the time that we are um, arguing this um, issue at trial. Next slide. So the applicant um, understandably was a little uh, concerned about this because they said, whoa, 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 whoa. We started using first. We filed first. Clearly, we have priority, and we need to at least be able to introduce that evidence into the record. Priority isn't just said and done based on the fact that they were able to get this registration during the pendency of our proceeding. Um, the board said, nope, it doesn't matter that you were a first in time user, it doesn't matter that you were a first filer. Um, you didn't do anything when they initially filed this application, and so you are basically making an impermissible collateral attack against the registration. You should have asserted a counterclaim a long time ago, and you did not. So, and the board said, look, you know, when this thing, it, you knew it was published during the pendency of the opposition, you could have filed a separate opposition against it, challenging it, um, or, you know, you could have petitioned to cancel it after it registered. You did neither of those things, and you waited until trial um, to attack based on priority, and that's essentially attacking the underlying <clears throat> registration, which you can't do because the cancellation would have been a compulsory counterclaim that you should have brought before. Um, there is statutory language that sort of uh, supports this position. Um, the the board really sliced and diced um, section 2D and said that the registration um, looked at, you know, refusal of a registration and said, well, that's where a mark so resembles a mark registered at the USPTO or previously used. Here, they asserted a registered mark, a previously registered mark, that's sufficient. Um, and also rule 2.106B32 came into play, which says basically um, you can't attack the validity of a registration unless, as I said earlier, you know, you've issued or you've asserted a proper um, counterclaim. So this really kind of puts the applicant, in my view, in a difficult decision. Next slide. Or difficult position, I should say. So there's language in the opinion and this there was an original opinion and then um the applicant moved for reconsideration and that was denied and the board said had the applicant chosen to file an answer and a counterclaim seeking cancellation of opposer's registration she would have been entitled to allege basically in the alternative that there's no likelihood of confusion or if there is we had priority so we still win um but take a look at the timeline again here. So we have the opposers filing date They They filed the application in June of 2020. They then filed the notice of opposition. That registration didn't issue until August of 2021, but the opposer was supposed to answer by July of 2020, well before, you know, it could have petitioned to cancel or filed um, a counterclaim to cancel in its answer. And so there's this difficult situation here where you, you need to know that if you are the subject of an opposition and an opposer is asserting a pending um, application, you better pay attention to what that application is doing and you better do something about it as soon as you know that either the application is published um, for registration or um, for opposition uh, or um, you know, potentially they could maybe sought to amend later on and um, amend their pleading once they had knowledge that the registration would issue and that that would become an issue. But sitting on their heels and waiting until trial to use the priority issue to challenge that is impermissible and um, is definitely black letter law at the board. So really, really important um, rule to know. Um, next slide. So I know we're running um, towards the end of time. We did want to just touch on um, some things going on at the USPTO. So I will um, let Ken take it from here. And we'll make this quick since we are running out of time here. <clears throat> just wanted to touch on the couple of the proceedings that the TMA gave us um, starting about two years ago. The expungement and reexamination proceeding. I know most of the folks listening probably are aware of them and know what the rules are. Figured I'd give a quick primer on them and just add some statistics and a couple of tips. So, <clears throat> expungement 
is a method for attacking a registration where the mark has never been used. So it was based on use in commerce that's never actually been used. <coughs> Such a um, expungement proceeding, it's an ex parte filing, costs about $400 for the filing fee. And all you need, all you need to show is that the mark has never been used, you need to present evidence of that. It can be filed by anybody, and the identity of the filer is not necessarily known to the registrant. It might be, because it, it can be ordered to be revealed, but it provides a relatively inexpensive way of attacking um, registrations for marks that are blocking you in some fashion, usually during the course of prosecution. It can be applied against not only Section 1 applications, but also those based on 44 and 66, which is rather important because those two, you can get, as we all know, you can get the registration without use, but if you haven't used it for three years, it's subject to abandonment claim at the TTAB or this expungement proceeding, which in theory is faster and less expensive. Next slide, please. <coughs> Reexamination is similar. It deals with the situation where the mark was not being used on the identified goods at the time the applicant claimed use, which could be the filing date or it could be the filing of the statement of use. A reexamination re proceeding and expungement, actually, same thing, can be applied to all or just some of the identified goods. So it provides an opportunity to block, get rid of some portion of the registration. It must be brought within five years of registration which makes sense because otherwise it would be violating the, <clears throat> the board's statute of limitations of five years on registrations. It only applies on applications filed under 1A or 1B, once again, which is logical because you don't have to prove use in order to get a registration under a foreign filing or under Madrid, 4466. And again, anybody can file it. So if we go to the next slide, the statistics are rather interesting. The expungement proceedings, most of them are filed by third parties. Um, a fair number of them are not instituted. Um, as you see right now, we have, as of yesterday, 670, 699 filed, 125 instituted, 90 not instituted. On reexamination, though, the statistics are rather intriguing and coincidentally kind of surprising. Of the 1,654 filings as of yesterday, exactly half of them were filed by the director. And most of them have been instituted. If you look at the director filings, most of those have been instituted. And one of the reasons for that is, and one of the reasons why the office was promoting the TMA, is it provides a vehicle for the office itself to clean up the register from these fraudulent filings that have been going on for the last couple of years. In fact, Commissioner Gooder brought that up and when he was presenting out here a couple of months ago, that that is one of the tools that they are using, which is why you see half of the reexamination proceedings filed by the director himself. Not surprising, of the 77 not instituted, none of those relate to director filed reexamination proceedings. So move on to the next slide, and Lauren, you can touch on you know, some of the tips that we've learned and, and seen through looking at the decisions, which are available online, and we, we commend you to to look at those if you're preparing one of these proceedings. Yes, and you know, we're happy to answer additional questions offline after the presentation, but um, just because these, we, we wanted to touch on this because the, the TMA is, is relatively new and so we're still learning and we've had some time now after the first couple of years it's been in place, these new procedures to get a sense of what um, is being accepted and what is not um, and, and what the, the qualities of a successful petition are gonna be. Um, typically, you do need to conduct a pretty robust investigation. You don't necessarily have to um, hire a third party investigator, but you do need to provide sufficient evidentiary support. And there are some cues in the code that give you some examples. It's illustrative examples, not exhaustive. 
Um, and you do need to make sure that you provide an index and there are examples online. This is just one that I'm including here for your reference, but there's no magic formula to it just so long as you've made it clear um, so that uh, the person reviewing the petition can in fact follow um, your submission. So again, um, we've got some additional information about this. If you guys would um, be interested, feel free to follow up with us. In the meantime, we need to make sure um, that we have time to send you guys off with your CLE code. Um, the code is SS3457. That's SS as in Seifarth Shaw, 3457. And we thank you for um, joining us today. We hope this was helpful and you've got some takeaways that you will be able to implement in your practice um, this coming year. Um, anything else you'd like to say, Ken? No, thank you. We appreciate everybody coming and we'll do this again next year. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>